Welcome to the second day of the 2021 Clock Global Institute. My name is Melinda Earlywine with the Clock Team, and I'm pleased to have you with us here on day two. I trust yesterday was a positive experience for you. We know that no virtual event can be quite the same as our in-person events, but we have worked hard to try to make this the best experience possible. I hope you're learning new things, sharing new ideas through the chat and through the Q&A, but most of all, I hope you're making some great new connections. Even virtually, the highlight of all Clock Institutes is meeting new people. Our members will tell you, we aren't just an organization, we are a community. If you're not already a member, I hope you will consider joining. We have close to 3,000 members worldwide now, ranging from people brand new to legal operations to some of the world's leading experts and practitioners. Whether you want to be highly involved and volunteer to lead a regional group or a committee, or simply want to learn some new skills, we welcome you. When you join CLOCK, you tap into the power of the world's premier legal operations industry. Our members enjoy exclusive access to the people and the tools that are shaping the future of this industry. This is the place to find best practices, get answers, create lasting connections, and access new professional opportunities. Through our content resources, our training material, and experts, all can help you stand out and advance your career. To learn more or to sign up, talk to me, talk to anyone on the CLOCK team today, or visit us on the CLOCK.org page, www.clock.org, and click the Join Us button. In closing, I just want to say thank you. Thank you from the CLOCK member community, volunteer teams, leadership, and the professional staff. We deeply appreciate your participation and support. We have a great day planned for you today, starting off with our general session, exploring the profound shift in legal operations. I invite you to join Jason Barnwell as he sits down with Jamie Brigman, Senior VP of Legal Operations at McKesson, Trish Preston, Senior Vice President of Business Transformation at MasterCard, and Ellen Hudock, Vice President, Head of Global Legal Operations at GlaxoSmithKline. All four will explore the present and the future of legal operations. Also, I want to thank our sponsor, NetDocuments, for their support of this session. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the event. When I went to my first clock in 2018, only a third of the companies I was working with had someone dedicated to the legal ops role. That's incredibly rare now, not to have that individual, if not an entire team. It truly speaks to the value that y'all are bringing to these organizations as strategic advisors. I invite you to go to the Net Document sponsor page to learn more about how to make your document management work inspired. Hello, my name is Jason Barnwell. I'm a board member of Clock, and this is the Legal Powerhouse session brought to you by our sponsor, Net Documents. And I suspect this title makes my guests a little bit uncomfortable because having spoken with them, they're really humble. But knowing what they do, how they do it, and why they do it, I can tell you that they are powerhouses who are advancing the state of our discipline and our industry. Today, we're joined by Ellen Hudock, Vice President and Head of Global Legal Operations at GSK, Jamie Brigman, Senior Vice President of Legal Operations at McKesson Corporation, and Tris Preston, Senior Vice President at MasterCard Worldwide. So I'm not gonna go deep into your backgrounds, or your current portfolios at the moment, because we're gonna hear from you in your own words. But before we go into that, a quick note on our goal for today for the benefit of the audience. We are gonna have a conversation and we're gonna explore some concepts that set our organizations up for success as we adapt to not just serve businesses that are accelerating and becoming more complex. But we also build businesses in legal that create new types of value for our organizations. And this, is why the legal operations discipline is a cornerstone for creating strategic enterprise value. So let's get into it. Ellen, it'd be great to hear a little bit of your story in your own words. Sure, so uh, my current role is as a uh, head of global legal operations, and I also serve as chief of staff to our general counsel. Um, I came to GSK, I'm a litigator by background, so I uh, came to, I've been in now with the company for 16 years. 
And uh, it was really at the point of our new general counsel, James Ford's appointment, um, that the role of head of legal operations was created. And so I was uh, uh, put in place to create a centralized legal operations team. Uh, and so it's been a, a fantastic journey and I'm about now almost three years into role. That is fabulous. Jamie, can you give us a little bit of your story? Sure. I've been with McKesson for about eight years now, um, and I joined as our discovery counsel. I, um, you know, I came from a background. The first 10, 11 years of my career, I was a, I was a lawyer um, uh, in litigation and complex litigation, class action defense, IP, IT. Um, and then I moved over and really went into the technology space, the legal technology space, and um, consulted for many years. And so for me, it was this really fantastic you know, blending of the sort of two pieces of my career to come in-house to a company like McKesson in a, in a role like that. Uh, and we deployed a legal operations function, I think the next year. So over the, the next six years or so, um, we just began to, uh, you know, figure out a little bit of what we were doing and, and, and grow the team and grow the department. And um, uh, it's been just a really terrific journey and I'm excited, I'm really excited to, to talk with some of my colleagues here and of course my colleagues everywhere else because I think the one thing I'm finding is um, none of our departments are the same and it, it's so awesome to be in a world where you feel like you can be kind of a trailblazer and you can you know have your own path but also you've got really great people to you know to benchmark off of and to, to grow from so um, that's where I am today. That's fabulous. Trish can you give us a little bit of your story? Sure thing. Um, Right now I'm leading transformation legal operations. Um, I came into this role, our GC had asked me to um, come over and help him transform our, our organization, help him make the organization more scalable, um, build better tools and technology. Uh, I have a very varied background. Uh, I started out as an accountant, I was a branch manager, I was in a mortgage um, manager, ran a call center, an op center. And when I came to MasterCard 16 years ago, I joined the product management organization uh, and did that for many years, um, helped with some culture initiatives, transformation initiatives. And so our GC thought I was the perfect person with a broad enough background to partner with him to help transform um, the legal department. So I've been doing it for the last four and a half years and uh, it's been a great journey and a lot of fun. Excellent. So one thing that I'll observe from your stories is you come from very different starting places and you each have obtained this senior executive role bringing forward with you varied backgrounds that clearly adapt into the needs of your organization. And I think that's one thing that, you know, I, I suspect we will build on in the conversation today that there really is space for diversity of skills and perspectives, and you are proof points of that. But I want to start off in a, in a slightly more concrete place. Um, so Ellen, is there something that your team is working on right now that you think is interesting and maybe prepares your org for the future? Uh, yes, absolutely. Right now, we are working very much on uh, the plans to separate our uh, company. Uh, GSK is prepared to split into a new world-leading consumer healthcare company and a new GSK biopharma company. And uh, so there is a lot of work that you know requires us to be ready. It's our future ready program um, and to prepare for that split. And uh, you know, certainly the operations team has you know, I think probably a big piece of that is our technology roadmap and the technology that we're implementing to ensure that we can, you know, really automate, simplify, really, you know, make sure we have the right people in the right roles. Um, and it's, it's really exciting time. Um, and in my role as uh, head of operations, I'm essentially the business lead for legal, you know, with each of the support functions doing similar work. Um, and uh, then, of course, working very closely with the business. So lots to do and prepare for uh, with the split, you know, ready to happen in 2022. So that is a perfect example of the kind of dynamism that is just going to keep happening in 
art organizations, right? Like that is that is a that is a literally a tectonic <laughs> event that's happening. Yes. And I can only imagine that, you know, when when those come up, they're throwing that problem to somebody who ha has a, a special set of skills that allow them to really think about, okay, so how are we going to actually make this thing happen? And so when that when that problem shows up for you and your team, like where do you, where do you even start? Yeah, I mean, you know, and it really is about having the right people on the team, which, you know, as I've grown the department and really having the people who can work on the strategic delivery aspect, the change management, I, you know, I know that's a, a big part of what we want to talk about today and how critical that is. And there's been a real focus within the company, you know, of, of changes of past that don't stick, right? You make all these changes, you change roles, you, you know, you move, you move people around, eliminate roles, and then two years later, you're back to the same overall number. So, um, it, you know, that has been a significant piece is really, it's really, you know, I've been very focused on the support, more the legal professional support, um, in addition to the lawyers who are very much looking at how we're going to continue to support um, the organizations. I just want to say, Ellen, I, I think the exact same thing is that it's so important to have great people on the team and not just one skill set, you know, a broad, broad array, as you said, because the problems and the issues and the challenges are different as, as you move from one project to another. So, you know, I've always tried to bring people with me that I've worked with in the past that I know can be highly motivated uh, to work with me and on these great projects. Patricia, yeah. I, I'm gonna interrupt, let's build on that. All right, and actually I, I, I think I'm gonna want all of your perspectives on this, but Trish, let's start with you. All right, you're putting together a team. How are you thinking about like the pieces that you need and what's the configuration like as you're, as you're cause you started off leading a transformation organization and it sounds like your scope continue to expand. Can you walk us through a little bit of how you think about solving for putting together the right team? Yeah, so um, one, it's, it's understanding and setting forth the strategy and then looking at, you know, what are the major buckets of, of work that needs to happen and looking for someone who can quickly gain credibility, has a really good organization and communication skills, um, so that's what I looked for to um, really be my partner, um, you know, starting out of the gate. And then we looked for, um, okay, I need someone who has um, strong BA, uh, business analysis, can write requirements, um, has a, tech, a technical bent. When uh, outside council management uh, came into the group was, okay, who's someone who has done this before? knows the tools, um, has a background in dealing with lawyers. So, you know, just looking across. Uh, and then I realized, okay, I put together a team and, and none of us are attorneys. You know what? It's critical that I get an attorney to join the team, but one that has the credibility to build the relationships with the other lawyers in the department. Because then all of a sudden, when they say something, it gives me and the team a lot more um, credibility, would you say? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I just echo everything um, that Trish said. I, I think that's absolutely right. So I, I don't have anything to add other than one thing that I've quickly realized is when you're working on transformational work, people wanna come work with you. So it's, it's become, I think, maybe in days of past, an operations role wasn't considered as you know, anything to a, to a bigger career or an opportunity to advance within the company. And that has changed. That's really exciting. That's what I think is really exciting about the field. Well, so now I'm really excited to go to Jamie because I know that Jamie has launched a whole bunch of folks into operations careers, you know, as, as Ellen notes. So Jamie, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. You know, I think, um, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm just a big fan of, of, you know, diversity and inclusion just as a human being, because I think, you know, it, there's no problem that we don't solve better by having those diverse perspectives. But particularly in terms of just when you get really tactical about it, we were talking, I think, um, you know, about uh, DISC is one of the, the, 
the, the programs, there's Myers Briggs, there's DISC, there's all kinds of other you know, programs that sort of assess personality types. And we did that across my team. It was fascinating to see how we fell really across all of the different quadrants. So there were a couple of people that were like me, but most people were very different. And so for me, it's important to have that perspective because I feel like you really do get people who are just the, like stuck in the details and we got to get the details. And then you get people who are all about sort of the emotion and let's get the tone right. And then, you know, there are people who are just like, but we've got to finish it tomorrow. So I, I think, you know, building a team that brings all of those perspectives and lets everybody be their authentic self um, it helps because one of the things he said, you know, to, to Ellen is it sounds like you've got really great perspective to tackle this problem. And she probably does. She does. But I also joke that we're the department of the WWGL, whatever we got left. So we've got all these bullets of things that we do and we're responsible for, but we're also the place where problems that don't have a solution come to land. So I'd say a lot of the time we get a problem to deal with that we're not equipped for and we have to figure it out. And so to do that, I think that well-rounded group of individuals from different backgrounds, certainly folks that you trust, you know, Trish, like you were saying, that, that that's really an important piece too. But that's been a really big piece of it for me is trying to build a team with really complementary, respectful, but, but, you know, rounded perspectives. So, all right, now you've, you've piqued my curiosity on something because I think you're absolutely right that when you, when you bring together operations excellence and uh, legal acumen, it really is a, a great mechanism for solving all kinds of weird problems that don't have a home. The danger, of course, is you, you can become the island of lost toys if you're not careful. And so one of the things that I would love to hear from you, Jamie, is how do you think about what you're going to go after and what you're going to prioritize in your portfolio? Yeah, I mean, for us, you know, we've got a motto at, um, at McKesson um, that we're, you know, we're, we're, we're spending a lot of time on these days called do less than obsess. And it's, it's, it's really just about, you know, taking a look at your priorities and figuring out, look, you, you probably don't have time for everything on your to-do list, none of us do. So let's be really intentional about that. And let's figure out, you know, what are the things that we're going to give ourselves the grace to not, you know, be staring at us every morning on our to-do list so we can focus on those other things that are important. And for us, you know, it was really about, um, so one of the things we built into my organization this year was project management, like the discipline, the team of project management, which is terrific. And, relate to that party. I think many of you have had that already. But we deployed Smartsheet. You know, there's any number of other tools that work. And we really started with roadmaps and coming up with what are all the projects that are on our to-do list, our backlog, and then how do I we prioritize them, you know, with our resources. And then, you know, as we talk through them, we figure out, you know, you've got these eight projects that you plan on doing over the same two week period with the same two people. That's probably not realistic. So, you know, let's make some tough choices. Um, so for us, it was really formal. It was getting formal about what are the roadmap items we want to accomplish? What's the time frame? And then like, just what don't we have time to do? So one of the things I'm hearing is you're being really thoughtful about creating a, a, an, an intentional process with you know, measurement and the ability to understand like, where are we, where are we going? And then ultimately figure out probably, did this work? Did it create the value we expected? And I think that's a hallmark of a very, very mature organization that is really thinking very thoughtfully about, okay, if I have limited resources and I need to get the most important stuff done, like wrapping that in that process is, I, th I think that really helps deliver a whole lot of success. It's also just a really easy way. Part of it was just because I, you know, I had a million post-it notes whenever I would have to sort of try to give a, you know, here are some great things that I want to I want to pat my team on the back about when I was speaking with my you know my peers or the leadership team, and so part of it was just a cheat sheet that it was easier for me to you know to 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 see all of this sort of in one place where we work together. Well, okay, now now you opened a door that we have to walk through. Um, so, you know, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this to to Ellen. So. How, how do you think about telling the story of what your team does, both within the department and also when you're starting to interface across those organizational boundaries? Do you have any ways of, of thinking? Like what, can you give me a little bit of a sense of your process on that? Yeah, this was actually a big piece of, uh, you know, when we talked about our purpose and culture, especially, you know, 
back with our new general counsel. And we really, you know, we're focused on the concept of running legal like a business for the business. And so, you know, it was a real recognition of having, um, being completely aligned to the business's priorities and objectives. And the days of nice to have were done. Lawyers like to do lots of things, find things interesting. And we really had to say, look, if we're, we're running ourselves like a business and um, it, it, you know, and beneath that, we sort of underpinned the points of, you know, excellent advice, of course, is core, but also being a modern employer focused on development. And then um, really the, you know, the third piece, uh, which I think most significantly with my team and operations work smarter and better, right? And that we have the tools and the process and the, you know, constant prioritization, simplification. And then it's always sort of underpinned with data and analytics. So we actually know what our people are doing so that we can then share great metrics, show that we've actually, you know, achieved the accomplishments, have that cheat sheet, you know, to share then with the business and show, look at all these great things that the department has delivered. And then of course, the big focus too for us was like really being thoughtful about what is our culture? What is our plan to ensure that we, you know, are, have people who are engaged? And we and the company itself has a lot that we do to measure the overall engagement and just you know being in a position to have a very clear plan within legal. So that that's those are sort of the way. And now we're really thinking about okay, future ready. What is our new mantra going to be? Right? What is what is our new modern legal department? What what are how are we going to frame that? So lots of really great work and thinking. Okay. So you packed a lot <laughs> into that <laughs> that we need to get into. So first was one of the things I, 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 I heard is basically you are driving a mindset shift. So when you mm -hmm. say operate like a business for the business, that is potentially a radical, radical mm -hmm. departure from how many organizations, you know, how they were born, right? Because if you, if you really go back in time, a lot of uh, corporate legal organizations basically started off as the captive, uh, like outside law firm, right? And, yeah. and they had a lot of that traits, which has a very different mindset and a very different kind of bent about how it thinks about what it does. And so I guess, can you give me a little bit more about like, do you, I guess, I mean, I guess I'll ask it this way. What, what is the process to get somebody who might have grown up under the old mindset to start really thinking about how they work in this new mindset. Yeah, I guess it's always aligning to the company's objectives and priorities. And so when they come forward with something that you say, how is this really aligned to what we need to achieve? I, I understand you think it's a problem or something that you would like to address or you're passionate about, you know, but that's not really part of our plan. And so, and when, you know, then you people, you hear the within, okay, is, if we're really going to do that, is that really what we running legal like a business for the business? So, and that's really, that's been the shift. And it's just been a good way to kind of any time, you know, when you are trying to do more with less, uh, it's, it's been a good way just to really get, start the mindset change. So Trish, you are an expert in the change game. And I'm curious if, if you have any thoughts on, you know, if you're, if you're trying to make that big shift happen, do you have any thoughts on how you make it go even faster at org scale? Well, I think it really starts with understanding and making the case for action. Why change? Because as you're trying to bring people along, they have to understand why this change is important. So we started on a big change at MasterCard several years ago, um, and Ellen and I was uh, smiling and listening, similar thing, mindset shift change um, in terms of being the business. Our GC said, we need to lean into the business. We need to be considered more of a strategic partner up front. We're entering many new spaces we've never been in before. We're acquiring companies we need to make ourselves available and be a strategic partner and have a seat at the table. But in order to do that, you know, you can't just throw more bodies at it. We needed to figure out a way that 
how could we scale and be a strategic partner and still get the day-to-day -day done? So that introduced our concept of building a shared service. So that in itself, huge, huge change. But we started with that case for action. How can you be a strategic partner to the business if you're still doing every NDA and every procurement contract? So it was really building that case, um, helping our teams understand what's gonna change, when it's gonna change, being very transparent. So, you know, leadership is so key. Our GC talked about it at every town hall. He was very clear that this was his expectation and these were the milestones. Our team um, did communications, we did videos, we went to team meetings, all hands. Um, and then the other big thing is that being able to articulate how this change will be better for you and make your life easier. And also that you have to start small. So you have to get wins. And so we started with NDAs. And once people saw that, wow, you know, we're not doing NDAs every day. And then like basic procurement contracts, now our doors are being knocked down because we now have to have a prioritization list because more and more work is coming our way. So again, it starts with a case for action, leadership, communication, recognition of the results and the successes. And you know what? A lot of persistence and a lot of patience. Um, I also worked for a gentleman once who used the phrase, which I love, rinse and repeat. You have to constantly rinse and repeat your strategy, your vision, the why, here, what's, what's happening. That makes a lot of sense. And you've given us a very holistic view of how you make very smart complementary investments that move the whole organization forward in a, in a very thoughtful and intentional way. And one thing you started uh, hinting at that I, I actually wanna bug Jamie on, relationships. Jamie, as you're thinking about putting that plan together and how you're gonna drive it, do you have any thoughts on the importance of relationships? Because you, you've offered some thoughts on this that I've found very compelling. Yeah, I mean, I, I hate being the third one to respond after those two because they, they say so many things and I'm just like, yeah, right on. Uh, <laughs> respond to that I just say that. I lose my train of thought, I don't have time. But, uh, but, but, you know, all the things that you said really, really resonated. And I think in particular, like the concept of small wins and, and, and starting with, you know, things that are palatable, the NDA. I mean, there aren't a lot of people that have a really strong emotional attachment to, you know, you can't take my NDA away from me. So, you know, finding things that I think will demonstrate um, the larger goal, but in a way that's not quite as painful. Um, I, I think that, and the concept of really trying to listen and understand, because where you're getting resistance or maybe where people aren't buying in, you know, you try and figure out what is that about? Is it because, you know, they're just, they're nervous that you're in their space, or is it that they're nervous that there's a complexity there that you're not hearing and understanding? Um, or are they just nervous that maybe, you know, they're going to get like the blame if we take on, you know, more risk than perhaps, you know, they would have advocated. So I think that really strong communication, you know, of, you know, hearing them and letting them know that you hear them. Um, and, um, you know, just, just, just sharing sort of the plan and the roadmap and checking in, you know, all of that, I think, goes to building the relationship, um, uh, I think, at first, but it's, it's really, you know, it's even the basic stuff, like it's tone, you know, it's just, especially now that we're in a virtual world, people aren't in a room with you, they don't see that your, you know, body is relaxed, and you're, you know, warm and friendly, so the language in your email might not convey or connote that, so, so really being deliberate about the words you use and the way that you approach people. Um, and, and just giving them, I think, uh, a way to connect. So I, I can't remember if it was Ellen or Trish that talked about sort of really tying the things that you're doing to the company's goals. But, you know, this is really helping with this goal that we talked about. It's a way that we can implement or impact that goal. 
MyGC changed our, you know, our, our vision for our general counsel organization to sort of at a high level, you know, manage and mitigate risk, add value, you know, and inspire inclusive leadership and sort of that add value piece of it. You know, I think people really are starting to get excited about ways that we can show that we're a valuable part of the business. So, you know, building those relationships is critical. Maybe the last thing I'll say on that is, I think it's also part of looking at what's the worst part of people's day? You know, are there things that they just hate? It's the bureaucracy, the red tape. It takes them 85 steps to get somewhere. Um, so one of the simplest things that we did has been one of the most effective. We created a shared mailbox. Our, our organization is the general counsel organization called the GCO. Um, it's called GCO Connect. And all of our invitations for all hands for town halls, all of our like FYI emails come out from there. The emails about here's who joined, here's who's leaving come out from there. But it's also the place where if you got a suggestion or a question or you like need information, but you don't know if we have a policy or who do you contact in the GCO or outside of the GCO, you just toss it to that mailbox instead of trying to find the right place and bounce around and we help you get there. And I think the fact of sort of that in the background too, just helps also to sort of credential you as somebody who's there to help. Um, and, you know, those little things, I think, really then start to, um, you know, to build those relationships that you're all talking about. One of the, the things that I really took away from that is we, we have to earn our place by solving problems and showing that value. Like, it, it, it's not enough to say, like, we exist. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> let me let me help you understand like why your existence here and the work you're doing got better in a way that you can feel and perceive because of the contributions that we make to this enterprise. And one of the things that I'm taking away from all of your stories and how you think about, you know, building your teams, running them and, and the work you do is you, you, you all seem very intentional and focused on no, 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 no. We make this all go better. And the other thing that was you know, I think really important in what you said is you have to tell a story, right? You have to communicate. And I think one of the things that operations, uh, operations professionals don't always realize is value is not a self-evident thing. You have to give people a view on the work that they can perceive and that is meaningful for them. And so I'm actually going to, I'm going to bounce back to Trish. Like uh, in our limited time together, I, I got to tell you, you, you spin a good yarn. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts on, you know, like storytelling, like, does it matter? How do you do it? Like, how does it fit into the, the work that you're trying to drive? Storytelling is probably one of the most important things because as you're trying to change people and, and, and get your message across, you have to be able to do it in a clear, concise, compelling manner. Um, you need to understand who's your audience and be able to adjust. Um, building on the relationships is in your story, recognize what your colleagues are going through and how what you're doing can help them. Um, it was so important. We sent our team through uh, the art of storytelling of how do you tell a story? How do you adjust? How do you get people hook people right away and make it compelling, make it exciting. This isn't being done to you. You're part of the solution and we're all gonna be so much better off. So I'm a huge fan of storytelling and we work on it. I actually have communications uh, folks that report to me and that's a big part of what we do um, is, is tell the story, what's our narrative and communicate often. Fun videos, humorous videos are also a great way to get things across. Wait, wait, you, you, you do funny, you make things funny? Oh yeah. <laughs> Does it help? To me, it, it hugely helps. It, it hugely helps. Humor diffuses a lot of things and it also um, makes people remember, you know, uh, we're rolling out a new contract management tool and we're comparing the old to the new um, you know, we're rolling it out to our sales organization. We, we talk a lot in from and twos. And when you really paint the, the bleak picture and then here's what you're going to, but do it in a fun way, people remember. 
and then they get more excited and look forward. So, you know, I always say what we do, like we're not saving lives. So we've got to keep things in perspective and we've got to have fun um, doing what we do and interacting with our colleagues. So humor, big part of uh, what we do. No, I love that. I think, um, you know, it's also such a great way to build camaraderie because I think when people are reading through something, first of all, you're more likely to get them to read to the end of it or watch to the end of it, right? If it's not like, you know, monotonous and monotone and boring. But I think it also just reinforces that this is something that, you know, they're on that, they'll talk about it, they're on board. Um, but I think it also is um, an invitation for them to ask questions if they were unsure or unclear in a way that maybe something that's really formal and like policy is maybe a little bit daunting. Um, but I, I think sometimes, you know, sometimes you have those moments where, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's ah, uh, and I think sometimes it's because you have the realization of like maybe the, the top 10 most important projects on your to-do list are, are literally things that are like not even on anyone else's radar. And so forcing them to, you know, make some mental and, and physical time to engage when they've got their own list of very substantive to-dos, you know, what you're talking about is just such a great way to, to, to make that space. So I, I, I'm not gonna lie, your, your jobs sound rich and full of meaning and righteous problems and hard. And Alan, how does, how does someone convince you who had a very, very successful practice how do they attract you into this game where it is a lot of, you know, blazing new paths, bringing on new capabilities that may or may not exist in the department? Like, it feels like there's a lot of risk in that. So how does a GC attract someone like you to pick up that mantle? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. My role prior to this role was as head of ABAC investigations, and that was really you know, an incredibly intense role, global, you know, we have you know, government investigations, major China investigation. And, but it was like, really when I first recognized the power of data and metrics and speaking in a way that was clear and concise and engaging with stakeholders and how do you take all these complex issues and put them on a slide that's meaningful. And I, I kind of like really, and the like, how important a project manager is, you know, all those things that as a lawyer, you know, in certain stages of your career, you don't appreciate. And so the operations role was really in thinking of central, bringing together lots of work that I had touched, like e-discovery and information governance and risk. But then I, I did, it was really the aspect, the strategic aspect, one of like building the team. So that is certainly exciting. And I think that anyone in this space probably has a component of how do we make it better because general counsels are focused on their operations teams. So it's, to me, I think that's probably the biggest point of what belongs in operations. What are the issues we should be solving? What are the talent we want to attract? What are the types of, role? you know, that, that is what I think makes this such an exciting area in um, legal departments today. So this is something that I think people do not realize. They, when, they, when they hear operations, especially in legal, I think they have a very narrow view on what that is because what they touch that is often produced by op operations might be something that like it's, it's the end day process or, or what have you. But one of the things that came out of our conversation among all of you is you're part of the central nervous system of your organization. Information flows through your hands that other people have to like fight to get access to. And I don't know that people really understand that in a, in a modern legal department in a, in a corporation, it is often the case that the people who have your roles really have amazing access, horizontal access, not the siloed versions. And I think that one of the things that we can serve the entire community uh, is in probably broadcasting more of that message because I think you're offering a very compelling view onto the roles that we have. So Jamie, one thing, uh, so I, I, I have some inside knowledge. So one thing I'm curious about is how do you foster that talent? Because I have seen an example of, of one of your, your folks 
who is amazing. And, you know, that, that person's capabilities came from somewhere. And so I'm curious about how you think about growth and development of those folks. Yes, I'm still mad that she moved to Seattle and, and, and is working for you, but she's a, no, a terrific example. You're right. And, and, you know, and that's just one of many examples of somebody who started somewhere and, you know, then mid-career was somewhere else and now is sort of, you know, again, somewhere else. I think I, we've all talked about the fact that, you know, I, it's, it's a really diverse sort of um, department. So I, I think about it, you know, when I'm trying to explain to people, I sort of, describe it as if you think about what a CFO does or what a COO does for a big company, you know, my team sort of fulfills those functions for the small company, the small business, that is the general counsel organization. So, you know, it's a lot of the strategy that we're talking about. And it's a lot of these transformational things, but it's also a lot of really tactical day to day. You know, we've got to run these reports. We've got to make sure that this process, this meeting happens. We've got to, you know, it's, so there's a wide range of skills. And I think, we've got the great ability to sort of bring people in who maybe are in more of sort of an order taker mindset, you know, where they really need, you know, instructions and they execute on those instructions and they need a roadmap. Um, and then I think you can see who are the people who are asking questions about how does this maybe connect or how do I improve or enhance or think beyond. Um, and so I think that's how you start to ease people along into, you know, some of these um, maybe more, nuanced roles. Um, but that, I, I think it's, 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 um, it is really a varied mix of functions that we've got. So there's room for all, um, but you really do it just in working people. I'm a big fan of somebody may come in and their role may be defined as this, but we're, we're constantly reevaluating sort of our roles and what sits in what's one lane and, you know, what it makes sense to combine. You know, you're talking about sort of in some places, it's sort of part of the central nervous system. And I'm super lucky as I think we are to have access to peers on the leadership team and a general counsel I, you know, I, I love and, and work closely with. But I think it doesn't just happen. It's not like that role was advertised and we just sort of took it. It's, you know, as we have those conversations with our peers, we're trying to bring something strategic to the table. So if we're going around the table and our peers are talking about what's the big crazy problem in legal or in the corporate secretary world or whatever, you know, you've got something to add that's meaningful. So working up to that by sort of solving the tough, you know, tactical problems, as well as sort of some of these revolutionary things that Trish and Ellen are talking about. Um, you know, I think that's just how you build your credibility and also how you build your team. That makes a lot of sense. Sign, sign me up like that. I mean, cause that just sounds fun, right? And so one of the things that you uh, you started you know, kind of hinting at is the transition from being an order taker to thinking about, well, really, what should we do? And Trish, you have a mindset around this that I find really interesting. And I think it encapsulates some of the concepts really well. And we when we talked, you said, well, you know, a lot of what I'm doing here is I'm effectively creating a product. And can you, can you talk a, a little bit about that and how you think about assembling your value prop so that it, it, it serves the organization really effectively? Yeah, um, in our organization, so many folks wanna be in product management, product development. And I spent you know, most of my time at MasterCard in that organization. And, and one of the things that I always say is a product is something that delivers tangible value to stakeholders. So I bring the mindset to my team in saying, you are product managers because you are delivering value to stakeholders, whether it's our clients or our colleagues within legal. So if you think about, we're launching um, a new uh, contract management system. As we started, we're asking the same questions you do when you're building a product or an idea. What problem are we solving? Who's the competition? What's out there? We do our research. What pains do our colleagues internal and external face with our current system? And then what is our range of solutions? You have to build a business case, just like you do in a product. You have to figure out how you're gonna roll it out, how you're gonna market it, how you're gonna report on it, how you're gonna manage it. So I bring that mindset of, 
we're really the product. This is a product and um, we need to have that mindset. So that gets people really excited because they want to be part of it. You know, some people want to bring, you know, get involved in something or move to say our product organization. And I say, it's all in how you frame what you're doing. And so, um, you know, we're applying those product management disciplines. One piece of it is, you know, in, in, in the product organization, we like to launch minimum viable products. So I'm using that concept in rolling out the um, contract, new contract tool. We're starting small and then we're continually refining. So it's utilizing the same exact skill set that I used and managed and taught within the product organization. So that's how I also attract folks to come work for us is I'm like, you can gain some other skills here. <laughs> it's such a powerful point, right? I mean, if you keep convincing people, there will be a version two, you know, like let, let's, let's get rolling. Let's, let's, let's get some progress and then let's work on version two and version three and version four, but let's not get held up. Know, trying to reach perfection. You, you gave a great sort of 80%. Let's solve 80% of the problem today. And then let's, you know, let's keep working from there, I think. When because if talk- you try, because if you try and be perfect and get it all done, like if we were to roll this system out and have every organization, every acquisition procure, like we'd be working for the next five years. So, yeah. you know, you start with, you know, whether it's a region or a product or a type of contract, you get it right, and then people are just clamoring to get in, and you're building the excitement. You're getting out kinks with a very small population, and and then you move forward. And it's the same when you roll out a product. You know, you just don't go to everybody all at once. Yeah, and we apply the same and sort of within the tech world, but it's really now the way that we implement technology with the agile way, right? That you're not just going to a deadline, but that you're just constantly that, you know, exactly what you were saying. And I think the simple concept we use too is launch and learn, right? It's not going to be perfect, but we're going to launch it. We're going to, and then we'll adjust as needed. And I think that's been a good mindset. What have you said? Maybe it was Jason, but talk about really the, the, the sort of horizontal view that we have into it. So one of the things I love most about the operations world is I have a reason to interact with all of our teams within the department and even with our sort of other functions. I just, I love that. It's terrific. I think it's a gift. Um, but what it also means, I think, is when we have that product mindset that you were talking about, Trish, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about when we were developing the NDA template, we were building a system for it and it quickly became clear that what we were building was kind of a solution to the problem we were hearing over here from you know this other group about how do we how do we do the um, you know the business associate agreements you know that we need to get people to sign or something else in our bankruptcy tracking team and so I think having the insight into sort of those other problems across the other areas just let us say you know what let's not let's not build this too narrowly focused because this thing actually is a bigger product than maybe we thought it was. Uh, can I pose a question, Jason? Yeah, please. Uh, you know, so I think there's probably 80% of the department that will, you know, like the product that's being rolled out, want to implement the technology, you know, will come along um, with all the great work that we do to show how it will help them. But I'm curious to hear how you all address those non adopters. Right? Are they simply just never going to adopt, no matter what we do or say? Do you make things mandatory if you don't use the certain technology as part of your like overall evaluation? I mean, I think that we view one of the biggest risks we face in sort of delivery of you know our what we need as par- part of all of our you know sort of measures and um, benefits delivery is that people just won't adopt or go back to the old way too quickly. We call those people resistors. Yes. And <laughs> I always say in the beginning, all right, let's think about all of the teams, all of the regions, Where, who do we think are gonna be our resistors? And it really helps to try and bring them in to either review things or help you solve a problem. 
sometimes I go to folks, I know exactly what the answer is, but I'm like, you know, I, I really need some guidance here. How would you do it? Or what would you see? So that's one way that we've used. Another is, you know, mandating, like for our new contract management tool, we are taking names, we're measuring, we have to use this tool. And so that's the message that's coming from the top down. You know, I want to know, as I say, we're taking name and serial number of who's going to training, who's learning. Um, and again, I use a little humor, you know, to try and do it and say that, you know, we're all in this together and this is going to be better for you and for MasterCard. And we really need you to, you know, get on the bus. And what mm -hmm. can we do to help you? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, one thing we should mention is, is a tactic that you both use, um, you know, to start with is, is just, you know, you sit down with those people and try and figure out, is there a why? Like, are they just, you know, curmudgeons or is there literally like a, you know, they have the weirdest caseload ever and it doesn't work for what we're talking about. And it's you know, important to know that. So I think, you know, sitting down and trying to make sure that we understand where they're coming from. Um, it also helps that we have, you know, you talked about setting the sort of tone of your department, of your team. We have a, like a super low or non-existent jerk factor across our department, which I'm, you know, grateful for on a daily basis. So we don't have a lot of people that are just, you know, saying, you know, no thanks. Um, but the other thing sometimes we do if we, if we have some of those resistors is we think about, you know, does it make sense to... to to, to roll them into a version two. Are they a discrete function or a discrete you know, group or, so that we just go forward without them? And then what we're doing is not only making them feel more comfortable because you know, it works, but also we're making them feel a little, bit less out, a little bit left out because we're reporting these metrics and we're being able to tout these things over here and say, oh, there are some others that are outside the system that we're not, you know, we'll report on them separately. And sometimes I'll even say, I get it. I get it, I understand. And this is where I get my 80-20. I say, I understand you work on the 20%. You know, you're saying that's not gonna work. Well, we're not gonna deal with that now. I'm just asking you to like, come with me on the 80. And then we'll deliver and figure out how to solve the 20. But could you work with me on the 80? So that's another yeah. tactic yeah. and partnership way to go. Really is. So one thing that I think uh, Jamie started really uncovering that I don't know that we often think about as being such a critical part of the skill set is empathy and listening. Because, you know, so it, actually across all of your stories, so really understanding what is the thing that I can give somebody so they perceive value in this so that they perceive that this is something that can benefit them. And, you know, again, it, it starts with the perspective taking that that y'all have been talking about. And I guess one thing I'm curious about, and this is going to be a little weird, is, is do you have any thoughts on how you activate that curiosity in your people? Because it's hard to give someone a playbook of go ask these like these specific questions like you can there there actually is a process for it but as uh, as as has been noted many of the people that you have to deal with in legal sometimes they're a little bit curmudgeony uh, and so they may uh, be resistant to that so I'm curious as as you're sending members of your team out to be explorers and to figure out how can you create new value and how can you get that that value landed is there any coaching or anything that you give them that helps them be more effective in, in actually making these things stick? You know, I have explicit coaching. I, mean, I, I, I certainly don't get it right all the time. Don't get me wrong. I, mean, I, I you know, it's, it's, it's not like my team never sees the frustration look on my face or anything, but I think, you know, that concept of tone, you know, I, I was in, um, you know, a lit major with a creative writing minor and I'm obsessed with words. I just, I, you know, I really believe in the power of language. Um, and so I think, expressing to them that I think it's really important that our emails are always, you know, proofread, they're well-written, they're, you know, we walk away from them, we come back before we hit send, we, you know, take words out because they were too long, they didn't have bullets, so they were hard to understand, you know, helping them understand that, um, you know, the more time they spend on that email or communication, the more likely it is somebody's going to receive it, you know, and, and, and read it. Um, but we've also got, 
you know, training around things like, you know, let's, let's let an email go twice and then maybe let's pick up the phone or have a meeting and try to get face to face with people because sometimes, you know, there's, there's that, but I, I think, um, you know, I also share that there's a post-it note that I keep, I share with my team, you know, they all know this, but um, it, uh, it says, um, you know, uh, it says, ask. So first of all, when somebody's calling, you know, and I think I understand exactly what they want, why they want it, realize maybe I don't, and ask, like, what are you looking for? Um, and the other one is, is walking in each other's shoes. And, and so, like, understand, like, where their pain's coming from, where what their shoes are, but help them understand the shoes you're walking in. Look, I've got a deadline or a budget or a whatever, a mandate. So how do we merge those things together? And then the third is, um, you know, the third bullet that's literally there on my post-it note in front of me is we are all human beings. And it's helping them remember that, you know, even today when we're not coming into the office, we're bringing our suitcase and our suitcase has all of the joy and the pain and the frustration and the anger of the breakfast table or, you know, the fantastic night we had or the whatever. And it's part of, you know, what's wrapped up in people's responses to you. So I think for us, it's really just a lot of intentional discussion. You know, it's literally, we have these conversations as we're sort of training or talking to our team members. Um, and then it's, it's gentle, Correction is the wrong word, but like if I see somebody who, you know, writes an email that says, um, oh yeah, you know, we don't handle that. I usually sort of will chime in and say, you know, we, we don't handle that. It's, I think this is handled by so-and-so. I'm seeing her and setting up the conversation just so you're also sort of, you're sort of teaching um, by example. And it's amazing to me how quickly it's just people pick up and roll with it. Because of course we're all particular about who we hire and we want to hire good, kind, humans. Yeah, I think the human element is critical. And I think we've seen it like, you know, really now with COVID and all being at home. And I, that's like the part I really like. And as we were preparing for this video, all talking about the human element, things we're dealing with at home. And I think with the teams and even with the department, it kind of has helped uh, as we all just say, look, I need, you know, can I have your time or I think your point, Trish, about, you know, I could really use your help in like thinking about this issue or how, how can I, we bring your team along? And it, it has created this sort of, we're in it together a bit because we are just all dealing with the weirdness of, you know, the reality of working remotely for the most part. And we, um, we go on uh, and, and really talk about some of the values within our department. And first and foremost is decency and, you know, all around decency and making sure that decency doesn't mean that everything's always great. Decency means that we have the courage to give constructive feedback and, 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 and help. We also talk to folks about what's important is this language of yes, if. So let's, let's not have our first thing be no. Our first thing out of our mouth should be yes, if, I had the budget, if I had the time, like to talk about it. And then really having this bias for speed and end-to-end -end ownership. Jamie, I liked how you said if someone says, oh, do you do that? No, that's not our department, that's not us. No, we, we're here. How do you figure out with that person and do a warm transfer? So, you know, we have these values we continually push on and talk about, but it really, the underpinning is that whole decency quotient. You know, I'm fascinated, I talked a little bit about DISC, there are any number of other of those things that, you know, you can go through, but one of the things I liked about a formal program like that is, in addition to sort of figuring out where my team and sort of our broader team lives, I love that often what they're saying is, if you are over here in this squadron and you're talking to somebody who's probably, you know, this sort of a person, here are the strategies that you need to use to talk to them. So for instance, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people that is like, I'm all about like, let's get, you know, let's, let me, let me throw things out there and then let's get rolling. And, you know, and we're, you know, we're cooking. And I have people on my team that really just need to know, um, you know, need to know the, the, the details before they can dig in. They just can't, they can't do the work without the details. So understanding who am I talking to and what motivates them, I think is also a really important part of how you you know, have the right conversation. This has been an amazing conversation. I would love to get kind of a one minute takeaway 
from each of you on, hey, if you're thinking about how to be successful in, in senior executive roles, like the ones that you have, these are some thoughts for you. And so Trish, let's start with you and, and give, give, us, give us something magic. Uh, I, th I think to be successful in these roles, you have to be able to um, craft a compelling vision and strategy and roadmap. You have to be able to take big, complex, hairy issues and break them down into manageable chunks so as not to overwhelm. Uh, you need to be able to prioritize. You need to have patience. You need to have humor. And you need to really, as, as I say, be able to not say no, but say yes if to your colleagues and, and really be a great relationship builder and team builder. It, it, it takes a whole lot of leadership skills to be in these roles. Very well said. Jamie, do you have any thoughts you wanna share? Yeah, I mean, I think those were fantastic. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad it's on video so I didn't have to write them down and can come back to them. <laughs> I think, um, you know, being a human is really, really important. I mean, you are a human, so you gotta bring it to the job. You got a team and they're gonna bring it to the job. And so you need to, spend time on your team, getting to know them, make sure that they feel engaged, make sure that they feel fulfilled, like they have a path, um, help them, make, the, make, make them feel like they're supported um, because that's the way that you're gonna get good you know, work and good buy-in um, with them. Uh, you know, prioritization really is the key because there's just too much work out there to do. And, and um, you know, you're the one who needs to say, this is what I think is going to be, you know, the most important for us today. And here are all the things I think, you know, later on. Um, and then uh, honestly, don't underestimate the value of a network. I, the conversations that we've had sort of in the background or, or today, man, you just, you know, you can save me hours and hours and billions of dollars by saying, oh yeah, you solve this problem by doing this, or, you know, for God's sakes, don't try that to solve this problem. So I think find colleagues, um, and, and, and maybe finally, and more importantly, something I'm just learning is find, find colleagues for the folks on your teams too. So it's not just you who's networking, but so they've got people that they're able to say, hey man, my role could be like this, or, or you know, here's some takeaways I have. That is exceptional wisdom. Ellen. Yeah, I mean, I'd like, I'd say ditto to both Trish and Jamie. Um, and I just think, you know, the strategic mindset is really critical um, and not just being given a problem and solved for it, but always sort of having your antennae up to, uh, you know, hearing something and thinking, what can we do to change that? Or what, you know, should we consider or fold this in? Um, so I think that's really critical. The relationship piece, not just, you know, your team, of course, and then the stakeholders, right? That you're really keeping close to your colleagues within the department and in the business, because, you know, you might be sitting within legal operations, so not having a business client, but you're still doing work or engaging or actually potentially working on, you know, a solution or technology that applies across different functions. So I think that's really critical. And I think the networking, I mean, I have like five, but I want to ask Trish all about her uh, contract management system and right, because we all are dealing with such similar things and that you get, you do get these like nuggets of information when you talk to people who are in similar roles. So I think that's been, you know, really beneficial. So my big takeaway from the wisdom that you have all offered is that you are real business executives that you are thinking about what are the problems that need to be solved that when addressed, create the most impact. And that kind of owner mentality is something that's critical for having roles like yours that are very senior and imp create impact at the enterprise level. And then if people want to follow your paths, it doesn't necessarily require a specific starting place because each of you brings something very different and you have found ways to complement that with your team and, and learning new capabilities and just being a, a lifelong learner. But the important thing is that mindset that you keep evidencing here, which is we go find the most interesting problems for our organization and we have a can-do attitude about how we can make those better. And if nothing else, that's what I'm going to take back into my practice. And so thank you for that gift. 
This has been an energizing and exciting conversation for me. I have so much to go get better at. And so I just want to express the gratitude of the entire clock community for you taking your time and giving us these pearls of wisdom. And thank you so very much. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you.